Not at all. Okay, you're not satisfied. Now, I agree it's a problem. 80% of whites kill whites, correct? I won't dispute that figure. Okay, actually, uh, it's 83%. Now, uh, is white-on-white -white violence a problem in America that we should also have a robust discussion about? Violence in America, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Congressman, violence in America in general is, is problematic. Uh, but if you look at the rates, that's where it starts coming a little more into balance in terms of uh, the data I've seen, and I've looked at a lot of it, uh, the white-on-white -white crime does happen, 80% figure you uh, put out there. But when you look at the rates of it, these two things, these two are not even close. Right. The rates are, are roughly equivalent in terms of the, the, the context of people who live next to each other and because of housing uh, segregation patterns or just where people tend to live in America, uh, ethnic violence tends to occur, racial violence within the same group. And so elevating it uh, beyond that fact, I think, is irresponsible. We all uh, want to deal with the black on black uh, violence problem that was mentioned that there's a, a cooperation issue in the black-on-black -black violence context. I don't think I've heard the, the phrase mentioned, blue wall of silence, uh, here. So if we're going to have a conversation about cooperation when someone crosses the line, it seems to me to make sense that we also have to deal with what may be another elephant in the room, to use your term, uh, Sheriff Clark, the blue wall of silence, that the overwhelming majority of officers are good officers. But what often occurs is that when an officer crosses the line, the ethic is not to cooperate or participate or speak on what a bad apple officer has done. Professor Ramirez, would you agree that that's perhaps something that we should also be focused on? I think it's a serious problem both at the federal and state level. And as I said earlier, um, in my own experience in trying to um, prosecute police officers, I had problems. Here's just one problem. The FBI and DEA said we won't even serve subpoenas on a case in which there's a police officer as a defendant. Here's a second problem. They tried to testify in the case in favor of the police officer, saying that they had made their own independent evaluation of the case. This is a case, by the way, that was adjudicated guilty against all officers, and they were incarcerated for between 10 and 20 years after the trial. Um, and as you know, in Boston, we had a problem with the FBI, that there were FBI agents who were engaged in a series of misconduct with Whitey Bulger, and that went on for many years and was not prosecuted. Well, thank you, Professor Ramirez. My time is getting ready to expire, but uh, Sheriff Clark, you also mentioned that, you know, the use of force should be examined in terms of factual data and not an emotional foundation of false narratives. Is that correct? Did I get your testimony correct in that regard? Mr. Chair and Congressman, yes. Okay. Now, uh, what was the reaction to the Eric Garner case uh, who was choked to death uh, using a procedure uh, that had been banned by the NYPD for more than 20 years, wasn't resisting arrest, said, I can't breathe 11 times on 11 different occasions. Uh, there was uh, no response by all of the police officers who were there. Was that a false narrative that people in the city of New York and the country are reacting to, sir? Mr. Chair, Congressman, first of all, he wasn't choked to death not from the uh, report that I had seen uh, out of the grand jury testimony and even from the uh, medical examiner's report. He wasn't choked to death. The medical examiner ruled the death a homicide by asphyxiation. In the ghetto, that's called being choked to death, sir. Well, then we could have this discussion uh, later on then about the facts because we could be here for a while. My understanding is he died of uh, a heart attack, okay? So, but anyway, uh, you said that he wasn't resisting arrest. He was resisting arrest. He was told that he was under arrest and put his arms behind his, or hands behind his back, and he wouldn't do so. And that's why I put in my uh, remarks here the uh, reference from Thomas Sowell about when law enforcement officers tell someone under, they're under arrest and they can't use force to execute that arrest, we don't have the rule of law when it's merely a suggestion for them that they're going to jail or to put their hands behind their back. Uh, those are behaviors, like in the instance of uh, Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, where some different choices by the individual could have helped the situation. 
In other words, uh, Mike Brown was just simply told to get out of the street. Sir, so my, time has, my time has expired, but, you know, for you to come here and testify essentially that Eric Garner is responsible for his own death when he was targeted by police officers for allegedly selling loose cigarettes, which is an administrative violation for which he got the death penalty for is outrageous. And if we are going to uh, have a responsible conversation, we've got to be able to at least agree on a common set of reasonable facts that all Americans can interpret, particularly in this instance, because they caught the whole thing on videotape.